know what we do. So Silicon Valley Science Fiction Society, what the aim and the idea of creating this activity was to show that with current technologies and the advances in science, something that hasn't been possible and we're thinking about like science fiction, is actually possible today. We made a few steps about it. Some events, someone might have seen that. So we talked about invisibility. We're talking about like putting living organisms into places simultaneously. It was a tiny organism, but still, this was promising. And about like consciousness and how we can think about it scientifically. And and I'm just going to pass the speak to Gay. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, so one of the common themes about all of this, it's a something you read in a science fiction, but something which is already done today. For example, Dr. Z.G. Wong created a real invisibility clock. It's real right now. Uh, Dr. Tong, Tong An Lee, uh, our another speaker, he was actually doing the real experiment with putting living organism in two places. And uh, Adam Curry actually does the mathematical calculations to prove that collective consciousness exists. So all of those are actually scientists. It's not a science fiction anymore. People are actually already working on this. Uh, so let me say the inspiration for this talk. Um, you know that some of you seen this a uh, couple of uh, years ago. I think BBC did an interesting program on uh, Sir uh, Nicholas Winton, and you can see him there, and at the bottom, at some point they asked the audience to stand up. So what Sir uh, Nicholas Winton did during the war, during the World War II, he saved children. He saved the thousands and thousands of children, uh, their parents just gave them up, and parents probably went to the gas chambers, but children were saved. And when the audience stood up, and you see him crying over there, is because all this audience is actually those children who grew up. Some of them became Nobel laureates and some of them uh, became, a lot of people grew up there. So last year he passed away. And one of the things I started looking for is that somebody doing anything against aging, you get something like that to prevent it. I mean, this probably was something which is not fair. And the first question is, is somebody doing anything about it? So, you know who that is, right? This is what aging did to him. <laughs> this is another actress. This is what aging did to her. You know who that is? This is how he looked like. If anybody doesn't think it's a problem... <laughs> see? This is a real problem. <laughs> really? So you guys are laughing now, right? This is her. This is me when I was young. This is, young. And this is what I might look like. And for everybody who's laughing right now, this is you. Yes. So I want to see you laugh in 50 years. So, uh, like I mentioned, and like Anna mentioned, what we do is we try to um, get some topics which are real right now. What I mean by that? Who knows why the lobster is here? The lobsters do not age. Who knows why these jellyfish is here? Because it's immortal. Yes, this jellyfish is immortal, actually. In the biological sense, there's other things. I mean, yes, there's a lot of things you can put uh, in there. But yes, there are already proof that organisms do exist. And there's already proof in the nature. So, you have a choice. You have a choice between do something and not do something. Life and death. Age or do something about it. With that, let me introduce our featured speaker today. He is the founder of Sense Foundation and chief scientist of it. Uh, he is famous for many, many TV appearances, obviously. He's also uh, famous for the best-selling book, Ending Aging, Dr. Aubrey the Great.
What I've got here is a classification that I think most of you would probably get instinctively. You would say, well, there's infections, and then there's genetic diseases that a few of us are unlucky enough to inherit from our parents, and then there's the chronic pro progressive diseases of old age. Um, and then there's this other thing out in the stratosphere, this thing called aging itself, which is not a disease, not even a collection of diseases. It's this collection of rather nebulous, non-specific phenomena like sarcopenia, which is the... Um, yeah, the loss of muscle as you get older, or immunosenescence, the declining function of the immune system. You know, I mean, that's a fine classification, uh, you might think. But there's one immense problem with this classification. It's not the columns. It's the location of the black line. It ought to be here. It's absolutely essential to understand that column three, the chronic diseases of old age, are part of aging and that the distinction between column 3 and column 4 is purely 100% semantic. It is absolutely not a biological distinction. The difference is only that we choose to give the things in column 3 disease-like names and not the things in column 4. Now, you may be wondering by now why I have belabored this point so heavily. I'm going to tell you. The reason why this is so important to get right and why that it's so tragic that people get it wrong, is that it causes money to be spent and effort to be expended in completely quixotic and hopeless ways. In particular, more or less everything that is done to challenge, to postpone, to alleviate the things in column three is done on the basis that the things in column three are not part of aging, but rather they are diseases pretty much indistinguishable, in fact, from column one. So people spend billions and billions of dollars trying to find cures for the same thing column, for the same thing column three in just the same way as cures have been found for the things in column one. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's easy to see that it's ridiculous if you just go back to my little diagram. What we're saying here is that geriatric medicine is all about directly tackling these pathologies as if they could be eliminated from the body. Well, hello, they are side effects of being alive. You're not going to eliminate a side effect of being alive without eliminating being alive, which would rather defeat the object. So let's kind of not do that. Let's think of something better. But unfortunately, the overwhelming majority, the vast majority of um, money and time that is spent, whether it's in research or whether it's in medical practice, trying to actually postpone the pathologies of old age is spent in this utterly pointless way. So that is my first little rant. Now, I'm not the first person to point this out. In fact, it's been more than a hundred years since people started realizing that this was a complete joke and that something else needed to be done. And what they did was they invented this field called gerontology. Now, gerontology is ultimately based on one fundamental concept, one fundamental observation. Namely, that aging doesn't go at the same rate in different organisms. Between species, there's a huge difference in the rate at which damage accumulates. We just heard from Evgeny that um, lobsters, for example, are as, as good as immortal. And we can come back to why they um, do so well if you're interested later on. But even within a species, there's a certain amount of difference between how uh, one individual ages and how another one does. So you might think, and indeed these people, starting in their say a long time ago now, um, have thought that if we could study this phenomenon, this variation, really, really hard, and really get a good understanding of what was going on, then we might be able to translate that understanding into some kind of actual intervention. And it sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? But it isn't. The first reason why it's not a good idea is that in order to actually gain something in this way, you have to apply such therapies, therapies that, if you like, clean up metabolism. You have to apply them throughout life. And you know what? People don't like taking medicines throughout life when they're still healthy, especially if those medicines are experimental. You know, and if you don't start early, then you're not going to gain very much. Supposing, you know, taking arbitrary units, supposing you need 100 units of damage to cause pathology. 
and you don't start taking the therapies until you've already got 90 units. You can see you're not going to gain very much. That's one reason. But actually, there's a fundamental and much more profound reason why the, why the gerontology approach has been completely unsuccessful, and it's this. Um, you know what? Metabolism is quite complicated. This, that I'm showing you here, is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism actually works. And um, for those of you who write software, I'm sure you can immediately see that this is the ultimate nightmare of uncommented spaghetti code. Right? You are not going to be able to tweak this thing, to stop it doing the thing we don't want it to do, the creation of damage, without, at the same time, stopping it from doing something we need it to do to keep us alive. It's just not going to happen. So, it's a long stuff, unfortunately. But luckily, there is a third approach. And the third approach is what I call the maintenance approach, sometimes the damage repair approach. It says, let's actually not try to slow down this process where metabolism creates damage. And let's also not try to interfere in this process where damage translates into pathology. Instead, let us simply uncouple those two processes from each other. Let us separate them by going in and periodically repairing some, most of the damage. That's the fundamental concept, and it's really simple. In fact, in retrospect, it should be really obvious. Though it has actually taken a while um, to get it to being really mainstream, but it's there now. So the idea is simply, yeah, damage repair. You uncouple the things, and therefore, even though damage is being created at the natural rate, it does not get to the pathogenic threshold. This, the, here's the big reason why it should have been obvious to everybody, starting from year one. Um, we already do it, successfully, with simple man-made machines. Now you're probably realising why I made such a big deal about this definition of ageing being a phenomenon of physics, not biology. A car accumulates damage, just like a human body, different types of damage, fewer types, because a car is a simpler machine, but it's still a machine, and that's why most car manufacturers are able to plan the obsolescence of their cars and predict when we're going to come along and when and want to buy a new one. They know that most of us are lazy and we will only do roughly the amount of maintenance on our car that the law requires. Um, so, right, so um, they know how long it's going to last. But if you happen to love your car and you decide to do an unusually comprehensive job of maintenance on it, then the result is that the car lasts indefinitely. This car obviously is more than 100 years old. It was not designed to be. It was designed to last probably 10 or 15 years, but here it is. So it really should have been obvious that the same thing would be true for the human body. Now, 